we have music in the background? Silence is awkward, isn't it? It's uncomfortable. Is this uncomfortable? Uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable when I even know that I'm pranking you, right? You know, how uncomfortable is it for us to just sit here in silence? And we hate uncomfortable situations, don't we? How many of you were dying just now? How many of you felt like a tickle in the back of your throat, like you needed to cough just to fill the void? Uh, the fact is, I don't think we, we very much like feeling uncomfortable or awkward. We certainly don't like to feel uncomfortable or awkward in church. Uh, in fact, if you've ever tried to shop for a new church, then you specifically look for a church that makes you feel comfortable. You look for a church where the, the pastor doesn't wait too long to come up and get the message started and, and fidget around doing things that he shouldn't be doing in front of you in awkward silence. You know, you look for a church that makes you feel comfortable as soon as you walk in. And, and when you set out looking for that comfortable church, your quest probably looks a little bit something like this video that I'll show you here from Church Hunters. If it has sound. Just moved to the city and can't agree on what they want. <coughs> they are young and energetic and looking for a new church home. We'll take some personality tests, tour the sites, ask some questions, and based on taste, experience, and location, we'll find them the perfect congregation. I'm Corey Clark, and welcome to Church Hunters. We're so excited to find a church. We just started dating. Um, with the churches we go to now, just not, not for us, just not really doing it for us, you know? Right. I, I go to a satellite campus. I just find it hard to connect emotionally with a video screen. It's just... Okay, you cry during Cake Boss. So, like, we've been doing a lot of services online, a lot of podcasts. There are a lot of preachers we do like. Really good, but we want we want serious yet funny. Yeah, like commanding of the stage yet relatable, you mm -hmm. know? We're more looking for uh, the humor of Andy Stanley with the body of Stephen Furtick. <laughs> hey, guys. What's happening? I'm Corey. Good to see you. My name's Nick. This hey, is Molly. Molly. Hey, guys. Welcome to Church Hunters. This is your first church. This is Creekside First Baptist. So while it is traditional, it's still pretty current. Just okay. this year, the pastor started untucking his shirts. Oh, wow. that's good. Big deal. He does dress his age, though, so don't worry. He's past the Osteen suit phase, but he hasn't gone full Giglio yet. Okay, oh. so there's holes in the knees or no? <laughs> well, it's frayed, but no holes. Frayed, oh. no. Okay, got it. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, hey, let me show you around. Okay, right, come let's on. Do it. I do love this lobby. It's a great <laughs> lobby. You know, it's not too big, not too small. Yeah. There should be enough room to catch up, chat with your friends. So you but here's a great thing. There's a bunch of side exits, so if you need to leave early and catch the game, you can do that. Got it. Yes. Oh. Honestly, right up front, uh, didn't love the name. No, I, First Baptist? Who names a church that anymore? I just... Not these days. We're looking no. for like a Thrive Church, maybe Relevant Church, I don't know, Radiant Church, something. This is the soundboard they use here. Now remember, it's pretty traditional here. So, when Sunday comes around, they turn it way down. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. But the one knock on this church, they still use the child care numbering system on the screens. Ooh, oh. Yeah. Or as the moms like to call it, the Sanctuary Walk of Shame. Yeah. <laughs> The Sunday morning experience was just a little too traditional for, for us. us. I mean, the pastor's main point, 157 characters. I can't tweet that. I really think you guys are going to love this place. I like we it. We do. We like it. it. Yeah. You know, it's diverse, but it's not like too diverse, you know? Scripture heavy sermons? Oh, yeah. 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 What about, uh, is it community oriented? Absolutely. Great. Oh, women in ministry? The parking situation, you guys gotta see it. It's super rare nowadays. Come with me. It was like a, a maybe for when my parents come into maybe. town yeah. for a church for Christmas, Easter type of church. Like a holiday Holidays. type church. One of the main reasons that I love this church for you guys is that on your personality test, Molly, you scored high in service and hospitality. Oh, babe. And there's a great welcome team you could join. Perfect. Okay. And then Nick, you scored really high in need for accountability. Wow. And the <laughs> men's groups here are amazing. You're just, you're just gonna put that out there? Hey, just God like knows that. your heart, okay? <laughs> On the next episode of Church Hunters, I think you're really gonna love this place. They take relevance to a whole new level. This church identifies as inter -denon denominational This pastor speaks out of a brand new translation. It's the Tumblr Bible. <laughs> 
Okay, so when you've gone church hunting, uh, probably didn't look anything like this episode of Church Hunters, which is, of course, fraudulent. But uh, you were probably looking for a church that fit your needs in some ways, that, that just felt just right for you. They really just made you feel <coughs> comfortable. Well, we're starting this brand new message series this week called Uncomfortable, the Awkward and Essential Challenge of Christian Community. Now, the title of this series comes from a book by a guy named Brett McCracken. And over the next four weeks of this message series, we're going to look at the awkwardness of church, but also how that uncomfortable church can be good for us, the good that comes from being uncomfortable in church. So obviously, when we look for a new church, we're, we're not looking to be made uncomfortable, but what are we really looking for besides just comfort? Why are, why are we looking for it in church? You know, why would someone even go to the trouble of shopping for a church in the first place. If someone didn't already have a church that they called their, their home church, why would someone decide to go out and start looking for a church for the first time? Why look for a church? What are we looking for in church? Are we looking for entertainment? You know, do you go to hear live music or to watch maybe some funny videos or, or to hear an entertaining message of some kind? You know, seeking entertainment is a really terrible reason to go to church because... Well, we're not just that very entertaining, are we? You know, we don't really apologize that for that either because we're not really trying to entertain you. Why do people care if church is, is entertaining or not? You know, we don't care if our dentist is entertaining. Uh, you don't care if your mechanic is entertaining. You don't care if your kid's school is entertaining. You don't care if your gym is entertaining or even that, that restaurant that you love is entertaining because you know that none of those places or people or events are trying to entertain you. And neither do churches care about entertaining you either. So it would be really, really odd if the reason that you came to church, the reason you were looking for a church is, is that you're seeking entertainment. Where can I be entertained the most? Churches do, of course, have live music, but our music is not for entertainment purposes. It's for you to get to participate in worship with us. It's for you to join in with the songwriter to express love and devotion to God in words that you might not have thought to use. It's not just to give you something to listen to, it's to give you words to actually sing with us because something happens when we sing and when we sing together. When we sing together, and, and you know that it may be uncomfortable for you to sing out loud sometimes, especially in a group of people. I, I know that it's uncomfortable for a lot of you, but I really want to encourage you to, to force yourselves, if you have to, to, to sing out loud with us because something happens when you sing, even if besides just being made uncomfortable. Music is not just for entertainment purposes, it's for worship because music brings us together. Our voices become unified as we sing in unison. And God wants his children to be unified together, joined together to have unity. That was Jesus' final prayer for his disciples. In John chapter 17, verse 20 through 23, Jesus prays. For his disciples, and he says, I am praying not only for these disciples, he's talking to God, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That means for us. Jesus is praying for us in those verses. He says, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, just as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. And so when we, when we sing in here together, we join our, our voices and our hearts together in unity. We join in prayer together. The, the words on the screen, the words in the song become your prayer to God and we pray together, and, and our music isn't for entertainment, it's for participation in worship. So why look for a church in the first place? If, if not for entertainment, then for what? Well, today I want to give you three good reasons people look for a church, and not one of them is really very comfortable. Number one is community. You know, we're looking for community. Sometimes people go to church because they're looking for friends, now, to be honest, I, I don't really think that this happens as much as it used to. This happens less and less because of the changes in our culture, because face-to-face -face friendships now are becoming less and less important to us. We'd rather scroll through our friends on Facebook than talk to them face-to-face. -face. We'd rather 
you know, peer into our friends' lives through Instagram than, than be the ones with them on those experiences so we can take their pictures and they don't have to take selfies, you know, or we'd rather, um, you know, go online <coughs> and play video games like Fortnite with our friends in different parts of town than actually be together and play the same game. You know, so we don't value as much real friendship, I think, in our culture these days. My first full-time job in ministry was as the associate director of single adult ministry, and it was at a large church, and this was in the year 2003, so this was 16 years ago, if you can believe that or not. There were no smartphones at the time. There were no social networks at the time. Well, actually, there was MySpace, but, you know, what was that? And uh, then there were... and. And because of that, they already this need for single adult ministry at the church had taken a hit. You know, less and less people were coming to singles ministries events at the church because of this brand new phenomenon, brand new phenomenon called online dating. Online dating. And yes, even all the way back in the year 2003, there was, there was a social stigma about online dating. Back then, you never wanted to admit to anybody that you had met someone through Match.com. And online dating was seen then as this ultimate act of, of desperation to find a mate. And yet more and more people back then started to try it. And so they no longer needed a church to help them meet people. They no longer needed community in a church. They just needed a computer to find community. And so times quickly changed. And and now, actually, when I'm meeting with, with couples that are in premarital counseling, couples that I'm about to officiate their wedding ceremony, today it's actually unusual for them to have not met through online dating because times have changed. And, and no longer do we need this, the church as this gathering place for like-minded people to find friends and to possibly even find a, a friend that would be a potential mate. No, now we can do that online. And social media has taken that need for friendship or lack thereof and to a whole new level. And this perceived need for friendship no longer seems to drive people to the church. And it's not necessarily a bad thing because honestly, just like church isn't in the business of trying to entertain you, the church is not really looking to help you find friends either. We want you to find community, but friendship and community are a little bit different from one another. So what's the difference between community and friendship? Well, for starters, your community often contains your friends, but your community is not always made up only of your friends. Sometimes, even your church community can be made up of people that you really don't like that much, that, that you really are, don't consider your friends. They may be <coughs> awkward people. Maybe they're people that are much different from you. They're in a completely different age group or stage in life. We'll talk a little bit more about these uncomfortable people uh, in church and later on in the series. But your church community then is not only about friendship. It's about primarily your church community is about challenge. It's about challenge. It's a group of people who challenge you to live every day on mission. And here's the thing about being challenged. Usually challenges are challenging. Usually challenges are uncomfortable. It wouldn't be a challenge if it wasn't challenging. And challenging things can be difficult and can, can be uncomfortable. And we need to be challenged. We want a community of people in our lives to challenge us to do more, to be better, to try new things. We need to be challenged to uh, live into this life that we are created and designed by God to, to live. We want to be close enough to someone to have them in our community where they can look us in the eye and say, yes, God loves you just the way you are, but you are not meant to stay that way. You're not meant to stay that way. We need to be more than just friends. We need a community that actually challenges us. And whether we realize it or not, whether we call it friendship or community, we look for a church ultimately because we're really looking for this challenging need to be satisfied. We need to be challenged. We need to be made uncomfortable by others in community. Now, the second reason we look for a church is because we're looking for coaching. Coaching. We're looking for coaching and direction in life. When someone decides to start looking for a church, it's usually because there is some kind of problem, this new problem that has arisen in their lives, this new situation that has occurred in a person's life, and they need help to navigate that new situation. They're seeking coaching and direction. 
some of the common situations, right, that arise in people's lives when they start to look for a church, and we've seen this for years and years and years, is, is when people first have children. And, and a young child, a young couple has a young child, and now they're young parents, and they've they found out that they don't know how to raise this little child to not be a little monster. And they, they want some moral direction for their little monster so they don't become this crazy psychopath in the future. And so they go to the church for some help raising their, their children. Or marriage, you know, a couple gets newly married and they need some premarital counseling and then they need the church to help get them married in the first place and then they need the, the church to help them get their marriage started on the right foot. Maybe, maybe a couple is experiencing problems. Maybe they've been married for a long time but then they come back to the church because of the problems that they have in their marriage and they're seeking some direction, some, some marital advice, some marital counseling, some coaching. Maybe you've lost a job or they've lost a job and they come to the church because they don't know where else to go and they're praying for a new job and they need some help, they need some guidance, they need some even networking that they can experience in the church. Those are reasons that people start seeking the church because they're seeking coaching. They're seeking coaching. In the Bible, we read that when people came looking for Jesus, they came to him for similar reasons. You know, we read of stories of people coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, is it okay if I divorce my wife? Jesus, is what do we do with this this couple that has committed adultery? You know, the same type of things. They're looking for coaching and direction. Now, the thing about coaching is, coaching is uncomfortable. Coaches highlight, it's their job, to highlight every single little thing we're doing wrong and to help us to fix those things. Coaches make us do things differently than we want to do them, than we would do them on their own. You know, I've taken my son Levi to private baseball lesson uh, lessons with a coach before, and, and I love this coach because this coach will look at Levi's baseball swing and he'll get him to hold his bat just a little bit different or he'll change his stance and he'll make some little adjustments in the way that Levi swings the bat and then he'll have him swing the bat and he'll say, does that feel weird? And you can tell Levi, the first time he heard this question from him, he was like, relieved that he would ask I mean, yes it felt so weird thank you for you know acknowledging that you know that's what he's thinking thank you for acknowledging it, it felt so weird i don't want to ever have to do it that way again and so he says yes it felt weird and the coach said good because the coach wanted it to feel different if he didn't feel different then it meant that he hadn't changed anything and the coach needs him to change something he wanted it to feel weird he wanted him to feel uncomfortable if you're seeking out a coach the coach is going to make you feel uncomfortable and the third reason we look for a church is because we're looking for, for change. We're looking for change. We, we may not know exactly what needs to change. There may not be the specific situation in life that we need to be coached through. All we know is that something in life needs to change. Something needs to change. When a man named Nicodemus was looking for G Jesus, he didn't really know what he was looking for at the time. And he was kind of ashamed even to be looking to Jesus for the answer to this mysterious problem that he had in his life. See, Nicodemus was this, this Jewish religious leader. He was supposed to have all the answers in life. He was supposed to already know how to do everything perfectly in life. So when he has this problem, he doesn't even know what the problem is. He comes to Jesus at night under the cover of darkness, you know, because hopefully no one will recognize him as he's coming to Jesus. Hopefully he can kind of, you know, slip in the back door of the church and slip in just a few minutes late after the music has already started, and then no one will have a chance to talk to him. Then, you know, he can sit on the back row, in the back row, you know, his quick exit out if he ever needs to, to get out of the, the church really quickly. Um, but he at least approaches Jesus because he knows something is missing. Something is wrong. I don't know what it is, but something needs to change. He's not sure exactly what it is. But he can tell something is missing from his life, so he approaches Jesus at night, not even knowing the question that he's even going to ask Jesus. Because, And it's a good thing that he didn't know the question that he was going to ask Jesus, because Jesus just kind of interrupts him before he gets a chance to ask the question. Anyway, Jesus jumps in, he interrupts him, and, and apparently already knowing in advance Nicodemus' problem. Jesus knew better than Nicodemus about what his problem was and what Nicodemus actually needed. And Jesus did this sort of thing all the time. He anticipated the needs of of the people that he met, knowing people's questions before they even ask, hearing the thoughts of their heart before they ever became words on their lips. And Jesus did that a lot because that's who God is. God knows our needs even before we ask him. God knows our pain and he feels it with us. God understands 
our hopes and our fears and, and our struggles. And, and sometimes he just can't wait for us to, to spit the words out of, out of our mouths, you know, because he's so eager to help us. If we would just turn to him, if we would just seek him, if we would just come to him, even in the cover of night, if we would just come to him and be willing to look to him for help, he stands ready and willing to answer the questions that we don't even know we have. So Nicodemus humbly comes to Jesus, not knowing what to say, and before Nicodemus even has a chance to ask, uh, Jesus interrupts him. Jesus jumps in with this uncomfortable truth that we read in John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark, one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Now, that's an uncomfortable thought, isn't it? I mean, even just the, the mentioning of your mother and her womb in the same sentence is a little uncomfortable, isn't it? And, and, and he couldn't uh, cast <coughs> that uncomfortable statement that Jesus made. His sentence is kind of gross, and he, he starts to think about being born again, and Nicodemus is so uncomfortable. And in verse 5, Jesus replied to him, he said, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you can hear the wind, but you can't tell where it comes from or, or where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. How are these things possible? Nicodemus asked. See, there are some things that Nicodemus just could feel were wrong in his life, but he couldn't explain them. He couldn't put them into words. And he looks to Jesus not knowing exactly what he needs, but just knowing that something needs to change. And Jesus tells him what needs to change. What needs to change? Everything. Everything needs to change. He needs to be completely <laughs> born again, to start over from scratch, to be completely made new. Everything must change. Now, how can that be? How is that even possible? Nicodemus asked. It's possible because Jesus can change everything. Jesus changes everything. Jesus is making all things new. Jesus offers us new life. He offers us second life, a new birth. See, people look to a church because maybe they want a little community, maybe they need a little bit of coaching here and there, and that's fine. But ultimately, what we all really need and what we all should be looking for is change for Jesus to make us new. And maybe the thought of rebirth makes you feel uncomfortable. Maybe those churchy words of being born again, you know, sound cheesy or hokey or uncomfortable to you, but, but being born again is what we all need. It's the uncomfortable truth that we all need to hear. Uncomfortable truth that we all need to embrace. We look for a church because we're looking for change, and, and Jesus changes us by making us new. So we confess our sins, and we give our lives over the, to the lordship, the leadership of Jesus, which is never comfortable for anyone to give the leadership of their life completely over to someone else, by the way. We make Jesus Lord, and somehow, in this, this spiritual way that we can't explain, like we can't explain the wind, Jesus gives us new life. So we embrace this discomfort of being born again, and somehow life gets better. Not necessarily more comfortable, but better. That thing that we couldn't explain that was missing from our lives, it's found in Jesus. That lostness that we feel, Jesus shows us the way. Life is better in the embrace of Jesus, and it all starts when we just embrace a little bit of discomfort, the uncomfortable truth of our need to be born again. So don't be surprised when church makes you feel uncomfortable. Don't be surprised when we do things in church that, that we never do anywhere else. 
Uh, where else do we gather together with people and sing out loud and, and pray out loud? And where else are you asked to give such a huge amount of your income away for no good reason? And where else do you, do you take a piece of bread and dip it in a juice and turn this newly soggy piece of bread? You, you eat it and, and everybody's sharing the same cup that's weird and uncomfortable. And, and you're asked to like confess your sins and to admit that you've own, to own up to, to all your mistakes and where else are you asked to go up in front of a, a group of people and be dunked under water? You know, that's just some uncomfortable stuff. But that's church for you. Because if you're looking to be a part of a church, you're looking for community, you're looking for coaching, ultimately you're looking to be changed. And change is never, never comfortable. So the challenge today is to embrace discomfort. Don't hold on to comfort because if you hold on to comfort, you'll lose your hold on Christ. You'll lose your chance to be changed. Jesus said that this way in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. He said, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. See, there's more to life than just the comforts of this life. There's more than just this life. There is eternity. If you'll just embrace a little discomfort of being born again into a life with Jesus. Now, if you're here today and you know that your life needs to change, maybe you don't know exactly what needs to change, but you just know that something needs to change. And if you're ready to make that uncomfortable step to be born again, then I want to invite you to pray with me. So let's bow our heads together as we, as we pray. Again, you may not have all the answers uh, to your questions, but you don't need to. Jesus will help you along the way. Just pray with me. Heavenly Father, I'm so sorry for my sin. Please forgive me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Today I receive your love. I receive your salvation. I trust you with my life. I make you my Lord. So please fill me with your spirit. Change me. Make me new. In Jesus' name.